Hi, this is Chris. Welcome to Carlos. Um, with me today for my third installment of uh, Pondering Performance is a uh, harpsichordist, harpsichord maker, um, founder of Omnia Records, and uh, a great and dear friend, Peter Watchon from Boston. So welcome, Peter. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Good, good. I hope I didn't leave anything out with that introduction. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the, the, uh, the, the full name of the, the label is Musica Omnia. Musica so, Omnia, yes. Okay. Yep. Right. Uh, and uh, that's uh, just a, uh, a non-profit classical CD label that I founded with another Australian friend of mine, David Fox, back in the year 2000. Uh, and in addition to recording all of my stuff, we were able to record lots of excellent performances by uh, some uh, very famous, some not as famous musicians, but all uh, well and truly worthy of being recorded. And, of course, it now means that those recordings exist, uh, which they wouldn't have done. So over that period, we produced about 80 releases. So Fantastic, fantastic, and not not only Bach, of course, because oh, no. uh, <laughs> well, a lot of lot of uh, in, uh, music on on uh, instruments of various periods, uh, and also some contemporary music. Uh, one of our um, uh, leading composer artists is the Boston-based Ralph Galvalek, who's my colleague at Boston College, uh, who's doing amazing um, sort of new music. Um, and Chris, you'd remember probably people like Sebastian Gurdler, uh, uh, Florian Berner from Vienna absolutely, absolutely. and the Hugo Wolf Quartet. Um, and just recently in Heidelberg, uh, Ralph was there for uh, a performance of his quartet Imagined Memories by the uh, um, Hugo Wolf Quartet, which has now been, been also incorporated into the Albenberg Ensemble Vienna, which performs in the music for Ryan all the time. Mm. Uh, that's another thing that we do, uh, Music or Omnia. It's been very useful for me because it recorded all of my own performances. But we were also able to record people like Jupp Schroeder, uh, Max van Egmond, mm. uh, Penelope Crawford, um, Saskia Colin. So lots of well-known performers. Uh, and uh, now those things are being systematically put up on YouTube so that a much wider audience can have access to them. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Um, back to back to uh, Bach for a moment, J.S. Bach. Uh, you've, uh, you've recorded um, pretty much everything of his, huh? would you say, like the, the complete... Yeah, I'm, complete I'm, I'm just, works. <laughs> there are just uh, all of the solo harpsichord works Everything is now done except for one volume of earlier pieces and the Art of Fugue, which is um, not, uh, it's still almost a little controversial in that it's written in open score. It's not really specified for an instrument, but the general consensus is that it's a harpsichord work. So, mm -hmm. and that, that will be recorded in the next the next instalment. So, and then it will be complete. Yeah, and it's been 26 years in the making. So, Right, right. And, yeah. the, and the concertos as well? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, the, the concertos with strings, I haven't tackled. And that, sure. that and the chamber music would be something something for the future. But the solo keyboard repertoire is so enormous, you know, to get that done first is, is yeah. kind of an important uh, first step, which has only taken a quarter of a century, you know. So at least I actually learned the music. Yeah, it's not side reading. Yes, yeah. I, I, I assume you've committed... Pretty much everything to memory huh? over over the years. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, re revising the well-tempered clavier book one. I'm going to perform that at Boston College in October because it's the 300th anniversary of the composition of the piece, um, 1722 to 2022. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm going over and and re uh, redoing it. It's uh, and it, it, of course, it's not anything like starting from scratch, but it's more work than you'd think. Uh, and I, it may well, uh, I may well re-record the piece. It's been 16 years since I did it, and uh, I think it'll be better this time. So okay. I think I might. I yeah, I wanted going. to ask you about as far as, as, far as uh, venues go, how do you, let's say, how do you, how do you choose a, an instrument and a venue for recording certain, certain um, by Bach? Um, 
Uh, well, for a long time, I, I've been music director in a church here in the Boston area, and it happened to have very good acoustics, and the pastor was sympathetic to us recording there, so we were able to do it. Um, uh, we've changed pastors, and I, the, the, the new ones maybe not as interested. Uh, but these days, it's actually possible to record in a lot of different venues because there are just so many different... Um, acoustical um, adjustments you can make in post-production. But as long as you've got uh, a place that's quiet, relatively neutral sounding, um, what you wind up with on the finished recording is pretty flexible, actually. And this is something that's developed in the last 20 years as kind of an amazing advance in technology. Mm -hmm. So, um, From memory in Boston, you have quite a, quite a few... Um churches around or around the, around the Cambridge area? Yeah, it's full of churches. The one I've been recording in is down in Milton, which is about 10 miles south. Uh, not that many great sounding ones, funnily. I mean, huh? uh, you know, a lot of, like, you think that sort of old 18th century revolutionary churches should sound fantastic, but they don't because they've got, in those days, the pews were kind of boxes for families and it completely uh, ruined the acoustic of the church. So, you know, they sound dry and dull yeah, um, yeah. but yeah no, I, I had a, a, a church where I could record and uh, the last recording actually the Goldberg Variations was uh, I'm not sure if you've heard that yet but that was done in uh, quite a famous studio in the Boston area that was used for a lot of jazz and uh, uh, pop music called the Blue Jay Studio and uh, yeah. we recorded there um, I, have, so I, have, I have heard it it's wonderful and I, I I uh, very much appreciate the, uh, the, the, the way you paste the Goldberg variations. Very beautiful. And um, I want you to tell us a little bit about the, uh, your new scrolling of the facsimile on the, on the, on the recordings, on the YouTube uh, recordings. Okay. Well, just quite by chance. Um, so it, it all begins with a, a Viennese pianist called Ingrid Hebler. You may have heard of her. She is very famous. She's still alive uh, in her 90s now. And she was a beautiful player of uh, particularly Mozart and Schubert on the modern piano, but beautifully done. Um, and uh, about a year ago, I started seeing uh, her recordings on this YouTube channel with Mozart's sort of facsimile scores. And I was so fascinated by it that I contacted the channel owner, uh, who's a wonderful uh, uh, French uh, uh, gentleman uh, from Amsterdam, but who resides in the west of the United States. His name is Jean-Marie von Bronckhorst, and he's a composer, exceptionally good musician. And... Um, so we, we got talking about Mozart and Ingrid Hebler, and I said, well, look, I've recorded the complete harpsichord works of Bach, if you'd be interested. I said, I said they're you know, all on CD, but nobody buys CDs anymore, and it would be nice for these to be. Uh, and anyway, he started systematically just putting them all up on his channel. Uh, and in fact, the name of the channel is, and I'll, uh, in Dutch, it's, it, it's Bartje Bartmans, so B-A-R-T-J-E. B-A-R-T-M-A-N-S, and it's an exceptional um, classical music channel. Uh, we're also systematically putting up uh, all the Atlantis Ensemble stuff with the Upschroeder, Penny Crawford in Sutherland, um, and various other things too. So I think most of our releases will wind up there, and mm. they get well, lots of views. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's wonderful to see the um, where where available, of course, the original facsimile, uh, the, the original score, and that's... Uh, well, um, that you, you might recall participating in uh, the recording of the Bach Christmas Oratorio like 22 or 23 years ago, and that is now up on Jean-Marie's channel with the facsimile, the autograph yeah. score. Fantastic. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> well, and that, and that um, recording has been uh, slightly revised and re-edited. I managed to fix a few little things internally, uh, and people still love it after all these years, you know, for... Live performance, it still sounds amazing. Yeah, and it's, I think, you know, as far as, you know, I'm concerned, I think it's fantastic to see, to see the original scores, and especially when I, was, when I was playing, you know, the sonatas and the partitas, to play yeah, yeah. from the original facsimile is just, it's, well, it's, it's, quite, it's quite enlightening. I mean, you see, 
you see different, you see ornaments in a different way, you see chords, chord progressions in a different way. Yep. And I, oh, think, I, think, I, think, I think you lose a lot of that, don't you, in, um, with, with modern scores these days? Yeah, well, <laughs> now interest, the, inter- the position for the keyboard works is, is quite interesting because for a number of them, there are facsimile autographs, for well-tempered clavier, for example, um, for book one. Uh, for book two, uh, there are facsimiles of many of them by Bach himself. But in the case of Bach, he had so many students, and these works were copied out so many times as sort of student exercises for use because they were not published, with the exception of the Klavierbund collection. Uh, the rest of Bach's keyboard music circulated only in manuscript. So what jean Marie has managed to find um, is uh, facsimile scores of many of the copies by prominent pupils, some of the best, like uh, Bach's son-in-law, Johann uh, uh, Altnikol. Um, so he did many uh, copies of Bach's keyboard music, but incorporated Bach's last revision. So in some ways, those scores are even more authoritative than Bach's. And of course, the penmanship's excellent. They're very well written. And so it might be one um, sort of once removed from Bach's own autograph, but they're just as interesting. Uh, And so in some cases, he's been able to use Bach um, autographs. And in another, uh, he'll use a score by Alton Nicole. I think there's another one, Johann Nicolas Gerber, who's another student, copied a lot of Bach um, manuscripts. And uh, so... The, the facsimiles are different and they're interesting. So, you know, and all of those, by the way, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the International uh, Music Score Library Project, um, the Petrucci Library, but that's where all these things are. They're public domain and they're free. Mm-hmm. Uh, imslp.org, anyone can access it and just basically find anything. Wow, that's, that's, that's really interesting. My goodness. And, and um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, yeah, performance. For, first of all, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, Bach, I think we can, we can safely say, you know, Bach is the universal genius of our time, of, of <laughs> his time. And, and as, far as, as far as performance goes, you know, it's, he's been subject to all sorts of adaptions and, and, uh, um, arrangements, of course. Um, yep. What do you what, what What are your thoughts on um, Bach for 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 piano for pianoforte? Well, I would preface that by by going further back and uh, and and starting with, with some kind of philosophy of of how music should be performed and. So it's quite clear that Bach's uh, keyboard music has, since it became known, it's remained in circulation among um, his own students. Uh, and, of course, in that generation was the crossover from harpsichord to forte piano. Uh, and, of course, those works remained uh, known throughout history. And uh, one of the things that I teach in my courses is what we call reception history. You know, how is what, what kind of a life does music have uh, when it's composed and after it's composed? How is it received in like different uh, periods? How is it understood? How is it performed? What impact does it make? And how does this all relate to the original vision of the composer? And how do we actually define what that is? And it's obviously in many ways a complex issue because, you know, there's the, the arrow of time. It only runs in one direction and that's forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you discover is that when you look, for example, at an entire millennium of music, as I do when I teach one of my principal courses, that um, every period of music has produced geniuses and human thought is extraordinary throughout history. And music is a unique art because it actually requires physical means to reproduce it, to experience it, whereas the visual arts don't. I mean, the visual arts um, require your own sort of viewing apparatus. 
uh, and uh, obviously visual art can deteriorate over time and it can, can require restoration. You know, we've seen what it's like when the Sistine Chapel was restored and suddenly you're not seeing, you know, 400 years of, of sort of candle smoke and discoloured varnish. Um, but what I tried to come up with was a, what I think is a rational idea for how music ideally would be performed. And that's not to say that it can't be performed in many other ways. Now, for example, Bach's music is beloved of pianists and you'll see more performances of Bach on the modern piano on YouTube than you will on any Bach. medium. And uh, what what's always amusing to me is when I see a lot of, you know, you, you look at YouTube and look at the comments. And of course the comments are just an incredibly wide cross section of people with different levels of experience, knowledge, you know, from lots of knowledge to none, you know, that they're just, some people are just responding to what they're hearing. Um, now, as I was teaching my course, I came up with an idea, how to define music as new music. In other words, what impact does music have when it appears for the first time? And uh, it seemed to me that if you follow the history of music right through, and that's how I teach my course, my kids all experience music of every period as if it's being experienced for the very first time. So I go to a lot of trouble to find performances uh, that reflect that. For example, recently during the COVID outbreak, there was a, a series of Beethoven symphonies uh, recorded by the Hanover Band, beautiful, full uh, definition, video, excellent performances. Um, and so my kids, for example, when they study the classical era, they get to hear a Mozart orchestra, a Haydn orchestra, they hear the innovations, a Beethoven orchestra, so they can clearly see that those brass instruments are still natural instruments. So look, with all of those elements, this is what I boiled it down to. This is what I came up with. So one thing that every composer in history seems to have in common when they break new ground, you know, the great composers, is that they synthesise what's come before them. They have a vision for their own position within the spectrum and they have some idea of how they want to get their thoughts across. And this is how I think it works. With all new music, doesn't matter when it was written. It could be Hildegard, it could be Bach, it could be Beethoven, it could be Josquin, it could be anyone. It could be Ralph Gauvelik. And in fact, I've seen Ralph do this. There seems to be a particular juxtaposition between the thoughts of the composer, the capacities and the expectations of the listener, the capacity of the performers, and the capacity of the instruments to perform it. And it seems to me that all great music pushes those things to their outer edge, to the limit. So, for example, the Beethoven Eroica Symphony was incredibly challenging for players who'd only played Mozart and Haydn. And the same thing when Berlioz wrote the Symphony Fantastique, which is still for a pre-industrial orchestra. Um, you can see that he is pushing the boundaries beyond Mendelssohn, beyond you know, now the thing is, yeah, also, also in the in the in the staging of it, yeah, with with instruments exactly. in different parts of the yep. auditorium, yeah, like, and of course, where you're thinking of things like the requiem with four brass bands on the stage in different corners, yeah, there's a, or, there's a whole spatial or, effect, or so it, with the, with the yeah, but exactly. Yeah. Well, once again, I think all you're identifying there is this same tension, and I've just boiled it down to this: composer, performer. Instruments, listener, those things, when pushed to their limit, create new music in whatever period. Now, with Bach, his keyboard works achieve that when you hear them on the harpsichord, particularly the sort of instruments that he wrote for. And it's clear that they use the full resources of the instrument. Uh, it's clear that they take advantage of the parameters, and I don't use the word limitation. Every instrument has parameters. Every performer has parameters, a starting and a stopping place. When those are exploited to their full, you get a particular effect from music that is lost when you transcribe it to another medium. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't successfully transcribe it. You can. 
Now, one, we talked about Ingrid Hebler's beautiful performances of Mozart that led me to the YouTube site where all my recordings are now. Um, and her performance is exquisite. The piano is beautifully prepared. Her articulation is immaculate. Uh, her phrasing, her tempo is gorgeous. You couldn't do better. Mm. And yet you feel that only a small part of an instrument is being utilised. It, does, it doesn't sound like the modern piano is ever challenged by this music. But if you listen to Mozart's music on a Volta or a Stein, the instruments that he knew, they are pushed to the limit. I mean, the instruments give everything. Um, and what the word I would use to describe a lot of modern performance of old music, even by really great performers who have all sorts of insights, uh, is, is limited. It just seems that the elements that made the music revolutionary and great and cutting edge in the first place are not present. Uh, are lost. Um, in, in yeah, a, lost. Of, That's right. Yeah. They're lost in the translation. It's a bit like, you know, what, what, what does it say? Remember the first time I ever heard the St. John Passion translated into English, and that just sounded ridiculous to me. And in a way, it's it's more authentic for English speakers in that you are you're not having to translate a language. German speakers don't translate it when they hear it. But a lot of the uh, a lot of the rhetoric is lost. A lot of the rhythm, the cadence, the very careful crafting in the original language. You yeah, just can't yeah, I, keep I, it. I understand. Yeah, and I th I think it's also with ornamentation too. A lot of a lot of a lot of times, you know, in modern modern uh, let's say interpretation of 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 the ornamentation things things are lost as well right? well it, actually it, it always amuses me that pianists spend enormous amounts of time fussing over the ornamentation when the sonority is just completely wrong it's not, not the anything intrinsically itself the instrument itself yeah <laughs> well and, and the other thing is this only works in one remember we talked about the arrow of time that moves in one direction and nobody thinks of taking a work by, say, Ravel and playing that music on a, an 18th century forte piano, even if the range worked. Okay. No one would think to do that because there is this kind of implicit assumption that later is kind of an improvement. Because in a way, you know, uh, we tend to consider ourselves in the present as the ultimate and the apex of creation, unaware of the fact that we're simply one more point in time that will eventually recede into history. You know? And if you're like me, you can see lots of points of time receding into history, even as we, as we live. You know? yes, yes. Um, so, and once, so I don't mean to say all that to, I'm not uh, critical of or dismissive of um, uh, Bach on the modern piano. You know? I don't like it on the modern piano. It doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I hear famous pianists like Angela Hewitt play Bach on the modern piano, and you know, she makes a rationale for it. Uh, she knows very little about the harpsichord, which is interesting. Um, and I sometimes wonder if modern performers on their instruments are kind of in a bubble that if they dared to expand their horizons outside of their own instrument and their own comfort zone. Yeah, I think, I think you're, yeah, I understand. I, th I think there are those, let's say, so under a shift, for example. Yep, he's just done it, exactly. Yeah, yep. yeah. Quite, yeah. quite aware. And, and, you know, he, and I think, I think he realizes the limitations of both. And, uh, well, the, uh, well uh, I use the word parameters, limitations as pejorative. Yeah. Parameters just means the, 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 uh, boundaries within which anything falls. The other thing that impressed me about Andres Schiff was the humility, the fact that he said, yeah, look, I dismissed forte pianos 30 years ago because I hadn't heard a good one. And as soon as I heard a good one, yeah, I was, and he just said I was wrong, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, doesn't make these people, it doesn't make them less than great artists. It just means you know, we're all trained in a certain way in conservatories, aren't we? we? We learn our instrument, we do lots and lots of practice to actually sort of think about the implications of music, what it is philosophically or historically, uh, is a different, it's a different way of thinking. And it's something that's been compartmentalized in our very um, hierarchical and uh, specialized 
way of looking at things. You know, you know, in in medicine, um, there are specialisations, and but there, there's nobody holistic who sort of puts it all together. And and in music, it's a bit the same. You get great pianists who play all this repertoire uh, as as great thought, not really thinking about the medium so much. And that's look, that's one way to do it. Um, I remember Thurston Dart wrote a great little book in 1954 called The Interpretation of Music. And, of course, Thurston Dart is at a particular time in history. You know, 1954, not very much was known about a whole lot of aspects of, of historical performance. In fact, when he talks about the Baroque trumpet, he says, well, look, you know, it's such a difficult instrument to play, it's never, ever going to be revived. Mm-hmm. And it has been. I know. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and I think part of it is just we, we are living in a time of a great information explosion. Uh, and I don't see it as a disadvantage that there are people who want to play music Bach on the piano. Or I think um, I think what's happening, and Chris, you'd be aware of this as a string player listening to orchestras. In fact, I would ask you this question. Do you notice how the, the, the performance in symphony orchestras has dramatically changed as a result of the historical performance movement absolutely i was i was uh, talking about that in one of my previous interviews with with uh, Ola Rudner, a conductor mm-hmm. i think i think there's definitely there's there's been so much influence from uh, from the historically informed movement for sure no oh, yeah i look i recently saw a, a great uh, video of nicolas harnencourt and he was with the um, uh, the um, in, oh, I think in Venezuela, yeah, it's uh, 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 conducted by, um, I'm forgetting the name right now, but uh, you, you know the, 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 the foundation I'm talking about, uh, yeah. sort of for training kids in classical music. Yes, 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 yes. The, um, yeah, 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 uh, and you even know the name of the conductor. So. Um, yeah, do not do the mill, is it uh, the... Do the mill, exactly, yeah. No, he was there. He's in this video. And mm-hmm. Harnencourt is inspiring these kids to play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but just telling them about the thought, about the rhetoric. And that's the thing that he always said. You know, he was never opposed to using modern instruments, but what he was saying was that a lot of players of those instruments don't understand the rhetorical origins of a lot of the gestures and a lot of the thought. Um, and this ties in with how I teach music. When I teach my students about music moving forward in time, you never, ever have to look retrospectively. You never have to look back in history and say, well, you know, that the orchestra was a bit primitive in those days. Um, you see the orchestra actually develop as it develops along with the music, and the music is a direct expression of the means that were available to play it. Yes. doesn't mean it's the only way it could be played, but I don't think you can understand the music if you don't understand the effect it had on the listener at the time, the instruments of its time, the thought of its time, um, especially challenging listeners, because, you know, listeners were challenged by this music. Mm-hmm. You know, there's tons of music from all periods that doesn't challenge you at all, you know, and that's not the music we're talking about here. But That's right. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to uh, talk about um, pedaling a little bit, so, so to, pe- to pedal or not to pedal. So, uh, so with, uh, let's, let's go back to, to Sir Andreas Schiff as an example. You know, he... When he does play Bach, he, he he chooses not to pedal at all, and that's mm-hmm. uh, that's um, that's 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 his choice. Yeah, you know, do you, do you see that as a a sort of a, a nod to to early early music performance? Um, well, I think that when you're changing the medium of performance to that extent, uh, um, you know, in a way, I, it. it you know, Walter Gieseking said the same thing about when he started, he recorded Mozart's solo music on the modern piano and he read somewhere that Mozart's piano didn't have a pedal. It didn't, but it had knee levers to raise the treble and the bass dampers individually. So he recorded all his Mozart absolutely without pedal. Mm. Um, and, uh, well, in terms of Bach, I can answer it in a practical sense. Uh, the harpsichord does not have... Um, sustaining or effect pedals and uh, the modern piano has a much slower decay rate than the harpsichord does so there's no way to play Bach's music that you actually need a pedal but 
the other argument might be that if you are transcribing the music for a different medium, you perhaps should just use the resources of the medium for which you're transcribing it. So mm. a bit of discrete peddling, you know, here and there doesn't hurt. Yeah. Back to It's like if you asked me, well, you know, how important is it to play Bach's ornaments correctly on the modern piano? Well, I don't know. Mm. Uh, it goes, it boils down to what you think music is. If, is music the notes on the page? Is music the thought? Is music the sound that the composer had in his head? Mm. Is it the effect that it produced on the first listeners? I think it's a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. Why music, in a way, is one of the most fascinating and one of the most frustrating of art forms because you can't pin it down. The other thing is it's spirit, in a way, isn't it? It's, it's inspiration. Yeah, you can't, you can't pigeonhole all these things. No, that's true. Right. So in terms of... If, if, Peddling. Uh, when I was a piano student, I played Bach for my first 20 years on the piano. I, I used discrete peddling where I thought it sounded good, but I became very aware of the harpsichord. For me, the main limitation in the modern piano was just how dull it sounded in terms of playing ornaments. Because on a harpsichord, when you play a trill, uh, the instrument has a, a very rich set of harmonics in the sound, and the, the ornaments become a uh, kind of um, literally an ornament, something that creates a special effect um, due to the particular acoustics of the instrument. On the modern piano, it just sounds like uh, there's something very dull and plain sounding about ornaments on the modern piano. Actually, you know, on ornaments on a modern piano, to colorize them a bit, I might add a discrete a bit, bit of pedal because it might, it might give a little bit of the effect that you'd get from a harpsichord or a clavichord where there's much more harmonic development in the sound. Jeez. The modern piano has almost no overtone development at all. It's designed to fill huge concert halls and it's strung at enormous tension. Yeah, yeah. And it's a beautiful sound in its own way, but it's not that sound. Yeah, yeah. How about the, the pedal harpsichord? So you've re recorded a few um, few of your discs on... on uh, right. Pedal well, as well. Mm. well, of course, we're talking about the pedal in a completely different context. Yeah. <laughs> because right. pedal, pedal harpsichords. <laughs> yeah, pedal harpsichords and clavichords were instruments that were used particularly in Germany for organ practice at home because you can imagine those large 60, 70 stop organs in church uh, needed quite a lot of manpower to blow them. Uh, you know, to, to sort of create the wind supply. No electric blowers, obviously. And that meant basically your students had to jump up and down on a, on a, a bellows holding a rail. And, you know, to even do that for an hour and a half while you're performing is, is a stretch, but to expect them to do it while you're practising, probably not. So, of course, pedal string instruments were developed. Uh, and this is, in the case of the pedal harpsichord, um, we have... A regular two-manual harpsichord that sits on top, and underneath that is an instrument with corresponding number of sets of strings, three. So it's got uh, ordinary pitch, eight-foot register. It's got a four-foot register octave above, and it has a 16-foot register, an octave below. Mm. Um, and that's a fully independent instrument with a two-and-a-half octave pedal board. Uh, and it can be used for practising organ works, but it also is particularly useful in some of the harpsichord works. And I think, I think the Germans just felt, uh, I, I think that most organists were harpsichordists. So I don't think there were many harpsichordists who didn't play the organ in general. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the idea of having an instrument uh, that kind of bridges the gap, it, 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 ostensibly it's a practice instrument, but if you've ever heard the pedal harpsichord, it's clearly much, much more than that. It, uh, it uh, is an instrument in its own right. Now, there's some thought, for example, that, um, you know, Bach's uh, trio sonatas that were composed for Wilhelm Friedemann when he was 10 um, were probably more often played on the pedal clavichord. They would have been written for the organ, um, but probably practised much more on, on a pedal clavichord. And we know from Bach's inventory that he had uh, probably a two-manual clavichord with pedal because he gave it to his youngest son, Johann Christian Bach, um, mm -hmm. before he died. Um, so it's very useful. In the Well-Tempered Clavier Book 1, for example, there are a number of places where it can be used. Uh, in the A minor fugue, number 20 of Book 1, uh, the end of the piece actually requires pedals. It's unplayable without them. 
You just don't have enough fingers to hold the parts down. Mm. Um, so I found it a, a very useful medium for playing Bach. For, um, for the Toccatas? For, for the yeah, Toccatas, big fantasias, yeah. Um, for example, if uh, Bach's, there were six Toccatas originally. There, there were always seven listed, but the seventh of them is really a concerto, the G major. But if you look at the D minor Toccata, um, BWV 913, it opens with a pedal solo, you know. It's written on two staves, but so much organ music was written on two staves too, you know. Very, very many of Bach's organ works were not written out in the modern way on three staves. Either they were written in organ tablature or they might have been just written on uh, two uh, staves. And it's kind of up to the performer what fits on the pedal. And I think German organists were so well trained in pedal playing uh, that where they could use it, they did. Yeah, um, I think you said that well. So you you think of it as a as a sort of bridge between between the harpsichord and the organ. Yeah, I think it. I think it is that, and I think it sounds that way too when you hear it. Do you, do you have Do you have a a pedal harpsichord there? You can. You yeah. Can... Uh, in <laughs> fact, when when I was working at the Hubbard shop, um, there was a pedal harpsichord. They only built a few of them. Uh, and it was mm -hmm. built in 1990, and I acquired it much later. Um, you probably would recall that um, when I was uh, a kid, I heard all the old, uh, they were old then, LPs of Isolde Algren from Vienna. She became my teacher and I became her biographer. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had a pedal harpsichord and recorded her Bach using it, and that's where I got the idea. So I really fell in love with the sound and saw that it was a great medium. I also remember hearing E. Power Biggs play his chalice pedal harpsichord in the Bach trio sonatas when I was much younger, mm. and uh, it's a very modern sort of instrument. It's not historical, but it was impressive, you know, in its own mm. way. And uh, he, he was you have, quite a, you have quite a collection of harpsichords, I imagine. Uh, so uh, Yep. At the Italian, moment. Italian ones. Uh. Uh, actually, I, I don't have any Italian ones. I've got oh. a Flemish single that I made in 1991 for Greg um, Miller. Um, I've got uh, the instrument Alastair built me in Melbourne in 1999. Actually, I've just bought a second instrument by Alastair, which is going to stay in Melbourne because I'm probably going to be spending some more time in Australia and I wanted to have an instrument in Melbourne to play when I'm there. Right, uh, right. And it's a copy of the 1728 Christian Zell, so another big German double. Big German. Uh, and then I've got the pedal harpsichord and I've got um, an instrument uh, copied after Andreas Rooker's 1646 rebuilt by Tascan. Mm -hmm. um, that's a two-manual instrument that I've used for a lot of recording. That was used for the Goldbergs. It was used for the Toccatas. It was used for the Well-Tempered Clavier Book One. Um, wonderful sound, wonderful sound. I love it. It is a good instrument. Uh, it was I used for that. It. You probably heard that volume with the Italian concerto and the French overture as well. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, it's used for that. It's, 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 a, it's actually one of the first historical instruments I ever heard on recordings. Frank Hubbard restored that in 1967, and it was used by a Swiss uh, organist called Lionel Rogg in of all things a, um, a disc of English virginal music. And of course, it's like a a Rooker's instrument rebuilt by the French, so it's kind of virginal music played in the in the style of the 18th century, but it was beautiful and impressive, and it's one of my favourite harpsichords. And it's also that one uh, one of the last instruments I ever worked on when I was working in the Hubbard shop. Yeah, oh, right. I recognised my own handwriting on the on the rest plank when I okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent one. Wow, Peter, it was fascinating. We we absolutely have to uh, repeat this and. Uh, uh, perhaps do another interview very, very soon. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be my pleasure.